Thank you so much, Dr. Fay. Uh, so good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome to this in-country dissemination workshop, <clears throat> excuse me, of the growth, poverty, and inequality relationships in Africa, GPIR project, which is in partnership with the ARC, as my colleague has just mentioned. So my name is Shay Vincent. I'm the economist, an economist at the NESG, and I am representing Dr. Olushegun Omishaki, Chief Economist of the NESG. So on behalf of the board and management, it is my honor to extend a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us here today. So this initiative is very important. I'm sure you all agree with me. So it's very important in, in supporting sustained economic development in Africa and also progress towards the sustainable development goals as Dr. Faith has already highlighted. So we are all very aware of the perennial issues of growth, poverty and inequality in Africa. So these are conversations that have been going on for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, it has even become even more prominent in these um, days that we find ourselves. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Bank already reported that there was declining poverty in Africa. However, because of the spiraling um, growth in the um, rate of uh, population, so this gain was not very extensive. And uh, therefore, we've had that the number of poor has has been growing, has been on the increase, and this has particularly affected Nigeria. Over the last few years, um, the economic shocks that we've had, such as the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine crisis, have reversed some of the gains that we've seen with regards to poverty and amplified a lot of the inequalities that have also been highlighted. Um, also, we have that rapid technological advances pose a threat to welfare for many people with low um, human capital um, endowment because they are not really able to apply themselves to get better incomes in these times. At the same time, these technological progress um, can also be harnessed for better living standards. So there are lots of complex issues that we have um, in the times that we find ourselves with regards to um, human capital endowment. So these and many other realities have made it even more critical to examine growth, poverty, inequality relationships to generate valuable evidence and policy recommendations for ensuring better living standards and inclusive development. So therefore, it's very, very important that we have and continue to have these conversations. So turning now to Nigeria, so some of you might be aware that um, economic growth has historically not been inclusive in Nigeria. So what we've had is poverty generally rising with GDP. So that's not the ideal situation. We want um, um, GDP growth to be able to help in tackling poverty, but that's not the situation we have. So I'm um, just giving you some recent figures. So the monet uh, monetary poverty rate stood at 42.3% in 2021, and that's up from 40.1% in 2019. For multidimensional poverty, this was even more drastic. So we had it rising from 43.7% in 2019 to 63% in 2021. So we see that the issues are still very present and even more pressing. So considering these observed trends, it is imperative to critically examine important nexuses for improving the economic well-being of citizens. Today's workshop is going to help us in that effect. So it's going to focus on the effect of human capital endowment, which is intricately linked to multidimensional poverty and household welfare in Nigeria. So as we know, at an individual level, human capital endowment is important for gainful employment, for earnings, and also for welfare, which the paper is exploring. At the macroeconomic level, human capital is key for economic competitiveness, inclusive growth, and for shared prosperity. During this workshop, we aim to provide evidence, um, engage in fruitful discussions, and share knowledge on 
developing human capital for improved living standards and accelerating inclusive development. Our distinguished panel of experts will shed further light on these issues and provide further depth to the discussions we're going to be having today. We encourage active participation and uh, looking around the room, I know that this is what we're going to get in our Q&A sessions. Your contributions are, and your insights are invaluable as we work towards strengthening human capital and socioeconomic development in Nigeria. Thank you all once again for your presence at the event. We applaud your commitment to advancing initiatives that seek to improve well-being and livelihoods. I look forward to a productive and enlightening session. Thank you so much once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Shea, for that very insightful um, welcome address. At this point, would like to welcome um, the AERC representative, the person of Dr. Scholastica Odiombo. Please <laughs> permit me. So just let me read just a bit of her profile before she comes to the podium. Yeah, Dr. Scholastica Odiombo is a manager of research at African Economic Research Consortium, ARC. She provides managerial leadership for the thematic research program and selected collaborative research programs. The collaborative research projects she manages are inclusive of the growth, poverty, inequality, and redistribution relationship. She also manages data governance and policy in Africa, Outlet Foundation, value chain and economic development in Africa. She also manages promoting results and outcome through policy and economic levers. Under her, we also have health, propel health usage, economic research for policy making in Kenya. Dr. Odiyombo is highly skilled in resource mobilization for research and innovations that improves livelihood and societal welfare. Can we jump our hands together as we bring her up stage? Thank you. Um, Scholastico Diombo, Manager of Research uh, from AERC, Nairobi. Um, I'm reading these opening remarks on behalf of my executive director, uh, Prof Professor Theophil Azumao. ARC um, is uh, of, as over 35 years uh, in existence within Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we have a capacity building framework. Our main uh, activities are around research, which is with capacity building on thematic research and also collaborative research, which are topical issues, contemporary topical issues uh, in economic challenges in Africa. We also have training uh, whereby we have um, three collaborative postgraduate programs. We have collaborative masters of art program in economics, uh, which is uh, in Anglophone Africa. Around 26 universities are participating in the program. We have collaborative PhD program which uh, is also housed in 10 universities in Africa, East, Southern Africa, and West Africa. And the uh, University of Ibadan is one of our partner offering the PhD in economics. University of Ibadan and University of Benin in Benin State here. Yeah. We also have collaborative masters 
uh, in agriculture and applied economic, uh, which uh, economics uh, program. Uh, it's offered in 13 universities. In total, we have 50 universities in Africa offering the postgraduate program, which are technically supported and the curriculum and the faculty being supported through AERC. On research, thematic researchers, over 4,500 researchers are benefiting from the program. And uh, for training, we have over 4,500 master students graduating from these 50 universities, uh, highly skilled, and also over 450 PhDs graduating from the 10 universities. Those are uh, some few milestones. Uh, we also have a commun uh, communication and policy outreach program. And this is where this in-country dissemination lies, where we use our network think tanks. Uh, we operate in over 46 sub-Saharan African countries where we have our network and think tank partners uh, like Econ Nigerian Economic Summit Group. So this has strengthened uh, capacity building, it has also strengthened our presence, and especially in terms of uh, policy dialogues, in terms of outreach and consumption of research activity, and most of it are all um, influencing policy actions. We have a number of alumni uh, from research and training in uh, from ARC who are holding a lot of uh, decision-making positions in central bank in Africa and also uh, within the, the governments in Africa, like uh, a number of state governor, Charles Soludo, is one of the, one of the long-term members of the network of AERC. We have cabinet secretaries, uh, central bank governors and deputy governors and also people working at the directorate levels of ministry, meaning that the outreach, the impact is being seen, especially from the human capital development perspective in economics and research. Like we have also relationship with governments. The government of Kenya um, is a, um, funds ARC to train its own economics. Uh, for the last time, um, about uh, over 12 years, they've been funding training of economists at master's and PhD level who uh, are go for internship at the ministry. And some of them are absorbed there. And uh, we are happy that we are making, um, especially the inroads into policy influence and also policy actions in Africa. Going back to this project, uh, this project was, uh, is an offshoot of uh, growth poverty and inequality uh, in Africa. So the main title is re-examining growth poverty inequality and redistribution relationship. And um, the first time it started with framework papers, uh, which were 14 framework papers. Out of these 14 framework papers, all of them have been published. One was published in um, Journal of World Development, the other, 14 were published um, in Journal of African Economics on 1st April. So if you go to the Journal of African Economics by X Oxford, you'll find a whole journal, a supplement, plus uh, plenary papers for June 2021, which had the, the overriding, uh, one of it was poverty and inequality in Africa. So a total of 19 papers were published, plus the plenary papers, plus the growth poverty framework. Uh, this uh, this uh, in-country dissemination uh, is based on country case study phase. And this is uh, our incisive studies within uh, several countries. And uh, we have nine papers developed by researchers from seven African countries. We have a paper today being presented from Nigeria by Henry Ede and uh, Jen Ozo. We have uh, um, two papers from Kenya. We have one paper from Ghana, one paper from Togo, one paper from Cameroon, 
two papers from South Africa and one paper from Malawi. Why this in-country dissemination workshop? One, it's provide platform for sharing evidence and also to encourage policy dialogues on issues on growth, poverty, inequality, and redistribution. We know in the advent of COVID, um, COVID itself was a, a confounding factors, uh, a major confounding factors on economic prospects of Africa. Already we had had issues before or ongoing issues, but it became in as a major shock given that um, uh, it, uh, uh, it caused a lot of fiscal distress and realigning of government budgets and expenditure. And now the recovery period is much, uh, the impact of the recovery period uh, in economic resilience and stability is something which we have to um, really, really uh, tie the reins uh, in most of the countries, especially where there was a physical distress and uh, there was a lot of debt, especially if you look at the debt data within the period between uh, 2020 and uh, 2022, there was so much borrowing in order the government to push themselves from the shock or cushion themselves from sh the shocks. And these shocks uh, now is when we are feeling it, them as citizens. All over Africa, you'll find governments are introducing taxes, maybe subsidies are being reduced. And these are shocks which are directly to the poor and uh, affecting the purchasing power within these countries. So we also that the discussion and for policy actions, uh, the discussion and deliberations here today will contribute to pathways for policy actions to improve, promote inclusive growth, uh, enhance distribu distribution of wealth, um, contribute to alleviation of poverty and inequality. And this will ignite positive debate of the findings and in order to address the emerging, continuing, continuous and emerging ch challenges around the topical area. As you have said, the paper being presented today here is the impact of human capital endowment on household welfare in Nigeria, where household welfare is key and um, having capital ability to be able to have skills, how can it be able to education, health, and training, how can it improve house, household welfare, especially house, households which are uh, disadvantaged due to economic changes and restructuring arising from some shocks uh, which are uh, unforeseen. Just to finish this, ARC sincerely thanks the participants for attending this uh, dissemination and expect, uh, we expect lively and fruitful discussions on the findings. Uh, we also sincerely thank Nigerian Economic Summit Group for convening this workshop. And also we sincerely thanks NORAD for funding the project. With this few remarks, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scholastica, for that um, opening remarks. So right about now, we'll be calling on the author to present the research findings on the impact of human capital endowment on household welfare in Nigeria. The person doing that will be Mr. Henry Ede from the Department of Economics, University of Nigeria. Can we put our hands together for him? Thank you very much, Margarita. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I would like to thank uh, the AERC, the African Economic Research Consortium for uh, technical and financial support for this particular project. Uh, 
Uh, of course, uh, without uh, the AERC, uh, here represented by Dr. Scholastica Odiambo and uh, uh, Pamela Kiwi, uh, these projects would have been barely done. So I uh, thank you very much. And also thank you to uh, uh, Nigerian Economic uh, Summit Group for providing the platform for dissemination of this project. So this is a, con a, a country case study for uh, Nigeria on uh, this title. Okay, so uh, the paper has gone through several revisions uh, uh, following uh, the several workshops that have been uh, organized by AERC. The mid reports uh, resume a uh, meeting that uh, was done online, and then the final report that uh, was done in uh, Accra, Ghana. And you know, there were several comments have been given by both uh, the project coordinators and the uh, panelists and also reviewers and uh, based on these comments we have you know revised the projects several times to be able to come out uh, with uh, this draft so uh, and it starts from the topic okay so initially uh, it was poverty inequality and inclusive growth in nigeria but you know, based on the copy received from our the uh, coordinators from the uh, uh, at the final review workshop, we, it was re re rephrased only to impact of human capital endowment on household welfare. Okay, but this is just a, re a rephrase. It did not change any key findings from the work. Uh, it's just to you know uh, refocus the work on the. Factors that, uh, of course, drive poverty, inequality, and inclusive growth in Nigeria. Okay, so and I'm working with my colleague Jane Ozo from uh, University of Nigeria. Okay, so uh, we start from the background. You know, Nigeria, of course, is recognized as one of Africa's largest economy. However, economic growth is yet uh, to be translated into significantly reduced poverty level. Uh, as uh, uh, or we already know that uh, poverty, that, that growth uh, is not inclusive. Uh, we have experienced between 2000 and 2014, the, uh, 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 the average growth rate was around 7%. Okay, but you know, we still experience increasing trend in poverty, so uh, which means uh, we can say that uh, that uh, uh, the poverty reduction uh, is not responsive to growth or is not commensurate to growth in Nigeria. Okay, and you know this is also supported by a World Bank publication that the growth elasticity of poverty in Nigeria uh, is relatively low. You know, compared to other African countries that uh, have experienced increase in uh, growth rates in the past two decades okay so you know they, they found that uh, in for nigeria that for every 1.0 percent increase in growth that poverty reduction is only 0 0.6 okay so um and you know uh, this uh, uh, could be attributed to uh, the differences in welfare levels across regions across the uh, urban and rural areas and across uh, geopolitical zones. And in the next slide, uh, we see the, uh, a chart showing an, inc an increasing trend in poverty rates in Nigeria. Uh, if you look at the, the first three bars, it shows uh, the poverty rates uh, at the na uh, national level. We calculated uh, using the national poverty line they published by the National Bureau of Statistics. Okay, so, and, you know, this also follows for po uh, poverty at the rural area and then poverty at the urban area. Okay, and then the gap between rural and poverty area, if you look at the, the fourth uh, the group of the bars, you see that there's also increasing trend and the rural urban poverty gap. Okay, so and that is the difference between that's the difference between poverty at the rural area and poverty at the urban area. Okay, so you know there are uh, factors noted to uh, be responsible for this, and uh, which was, was published by the World Bank in their reports titled 
uh, re reduction in poverty in Nigeria in the last decade. Uh, that you know, even with the growth rates, that there is also increasing po population growth. Okay, so which is uh, which also implies that you know the birth rate is also rising. You know, compared to uh, uh, other uh, uh, countries in, uh, in the world. Okay, so uh, uh, currently uh, the uh, average population growth rate is around two point seven percent. Okay, so like so following increasing uh, population, the, uh, uh, we can justify the fact that you know poverty growth is not uh, uh, the, uh, the poverty is not responsive to the rate of growth in Nigeria, and then again, uh, this is also attributable to uh, the rate of inequality. Okay, so the rate of inequality is also uh, rising compared, uh, if we compare the base period used in this study, which is 2010, 2011, and then 2015, uh, uh, 2016, you will see an increasing trend. That's in the next slide, we see an increasing trend in the level of inequality, okay? And see the increasing trend the level of inequality calculated with the Guinea in the index of inequality. And this is this also follows for a rural area Guinea index and the urban area Guinea index. And, and if you calculate the difference between the rural and rural area index and that of the urban area, you also see that there is also an increase an increase from 0 0.9 to 2.5. Uh, in 2012-2013, though compared uh, to, if you compare the 2015 and 2016 figure, it's less uh, uh, compared to 2012-2013. But if we compare with the base period 2010-2011, we see there's an increase from 0 0.9 to 2.5, and then from 0 0.9 to 1.7, if you compare the base period and uh, the figure for 20. 15 to 2016. So, you know, these are the factors attributable to the fact that uh, uh, poverty uh, reduction process in Nigeria is not uh, uh, growth, it's not responding to the uh, high uh, level of growth in Nigeria. Okay, so the key question is now what, how uh, does uh, human capital in terms of education and health contribute to a welfare differences? in the country. So that, and that is the first objective. And then the second is to examine the human capital drivers of total income inequality using a regression-based decomposition. The, the third one is to ascertain the impact of human capital endowment on urban, rural, and northern, southern income gap. And to appraise, the fourth one is to appraise the impact of specific Human, household human capital endowment on proper income growth in Nigeria. Okay, so the framework uh, is based on the panel household welfare generating function, where the household income is determined by both a set of exogenous variables, a variable in the household survey, and an endogenous variable, which in this case is education years of the household head. Okay, so the as a genus variable in, available in the data is age of the household, uh, the gender, the location, the regions of household, and uh, the, the endogenous variable referred to the human capital rate, which is education. Okay, so in using the endogenous variables, endogeneity problems, of course, could erupt from unobservable individual specific characteristics such as ability. Okay, so uh, because of this, we accounted for endogeneity problem and unobserved heterogeneity biases uh, using the uh, panel data instru instrumental variable technique. Okay, so I I will try to you know uh, uh, jump the uh, econometric. I know uh, most of us here are not familiar with. Uh, equations and econometrics, so uh, we uh, 
lay less emphasis on that so that I can move straight to the findings of the work. But of course, uh, it follows that here, the this uh, equation here was uh, used to so, uh, uh, calculate the uh, effects objective, which is to look 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 at impact of human capital endowment on household welfare. Okay, so. We try to compare uh, different panel data approaches because uh, in econometrics we have a fixed effect model, the random effect model, the first difference model. Okay, so but the uh, fixed effect and the uh, first difference uh, models they they help to eliminate this this problem of endogeneity uh, in education years. But the issue is that they also eliminate the time invariant variables, okay? So, and when that is done, even also the variable in the endogeneity variable, the key variable, which is endogeneity uh, uh, education years, does not sufficiently vary with time, okay? So if you make use of these approaches, the uh, these key variables variable will not be well identified in the model, okay? So we now resort to the random effects approach uh, based on instrumental variable technique, okay? I've already said, okay. Okay, this, this method is out for the second objective, which is impact of one capital drivers on a total income inequality. This one is for the third objective, the decomposition approach, which is for the impact of human capital endowment on regional and geopolitical zone income graph. So this is for the uh, fourth objective, which is an analysis of the growth inclusiveness and its human capital endowment sources. So this is the policy simulation that uh, we used to check uh, the uh, calculate the proposed growth and uh, compare it with uh, proposed. Uh, Proposed growth that's not adjusted for educational inequality and for health inequality to see whether removing inequality in access to education and health can help to improve uh, well being in the country. Okay. So, we made use of uh, uh, the Nigerian General Household Survey, uh, which is now currently in its fourth wave, it's in four waves. Okay, we have the 2010 2011 wave. 2012, 2013, 15, 16, we've, and then the fourth wave, which is uh, 2018, 2019. Okay, so, but there are reasons why we could not be able to make use of the recent wave. Uh, it's attributable to the fact that the sample size was uh, did not follow all the individuals in the base period, which is the, the 2010, 2011 period. So there was a refresh in the current uh, GHS data. So that the, the sample that can form panel data across all the waves uh, is relatively small. And when we, when we, when we tried using it, it, the results, we are not significant. We are not getting significant results. Okay, so the uh, sample that runs through the panel is around 1,500 uh, households. And when we uh, do the technical cleaning of uh, uh, when we clean the data, we see that the sample also reduced further. So in order to maintain a large sample that is uh, nationally representative and that we uh, provide uh, significant results, we resetted our analysis to 2010, uh, uh, 2013, and 2016 rounds of the uh, Nigerian General Household Survey. Okay, so of course, this panel follows the same houses over time. And this makes it a powerful tool for studying the dynamics of change in the poverty and inequality in Nigeria. It is representative of 36 states in Nigeria and the federal capital territory, with each of each round targeting around 5,000 households. Okay, so this is the first result corresponding to the first objective, which is the impact of human capital endowment on household well-being. Okay, like I said previously, we compared various uh, models, okay? So of course we chose the 
third model in, in column three, because it made use of the instrumental variable approach to deal with the issues of endogeneity in the education years. And uh, we focused on that. We see uh, from this model that uh, an increase in, in years of education leads to about 0 0.10 log, log points increase in household economic well-being. Okay, so uh, which means that uh, investing in education will of course help to uh, improve the household well-being. And for the second key variable, which is health, we see that uh, an increase in, it is measured with a dummy, where one takes sickness or illness and zero otherwise. So it's interpreted this way, an, in, a, an increase in Ill, Ill health will lead to a 3.34 decrease in household well-being. Okay, so of course this is expected because uh, someone who is not healthy uh, cannot be able to uh, go out for work. And this will lead to a decline is in his or her income. So uh, the other variables, the, the gender variable also shows that being female leads to 0 0.09 uh, log point increase in household well-being. So this uh, uh, does not seem to uh, rhyme with the literature, but looking at data, we discover that the household uh, expenditure is concentrated more at uh, uh, the female household heads. So that is why we got this, uh, this kind of result. So for the uh, sector, for the regional result, we see that being in a rural area uh, is associated with 0.31 decline in household well-being. And this is also expected because that uh, poverty is relatively more concentrated in rural area than in urban area. And also living in the northern area of the country is associated with 0.467 decline in household well-being. This is also expected. So uh, we now do the calculation across regions. You divided the regression uh, between rural and urban area and between northern and southern region. Okay, so we also see a similar trend at, as like we saw uh, at the national level that for education, we see increase uh, in rural area about uh, 0 0.07 log points. And then for urban area, we see 0 0.15 log points. So we see that uh, the effect of education is more in the urban area, okay, compared to that in uh, uh, the effect of education in the rural area. So uh, this is also expected because we uh, have more educated uh, households that are uh, concentrating at the urban area. Okay, this is also similar to the northern and southern results. We see that in the northern region, we see that the, the, the weight of the effect is higher relative to the northern region. And this is also expected because we uh, have more educated people at the southern region relative to the uh, northern region, okay? So we also see the same trend for air health that uh, ac across these regions, we see a negative effect, which means uh, a decline, it leads to uh, increase in it leads to a decline in the uh, welfare. So we see the results for impacts of drivers on uh, how, and, uh, a total inequality. So we see that the key factors uh, driving inequality here is the uh, education years of the household, uh, which is about 72.66%. Then now followed by uh, the zonal difference, differences, which is 13.7, then 11.4 for the sector. Okay, so which means differences in this area, areas contributes hugely to uh, in total income inequality in the country. Okay, this is the third objective that looks at uh, the, the, the impacts of this one capital on rural urban in, uh, income gap. Okay, so we see that following the previous trend that I presented on inequality, uh, that uh, there, there is some increase in inequality in the country from 0 0.38 to currently uh, to uh, 0 0.39. We see that in the observed outcome, we see that there is an increase in, in log incomes from 5.29 uh, to uh, 5.34, okay? So, and this is caused by the key factors in, in this endowment is education and health, okay? So they are driving these uh, income differences by about 
the 5.0 log points and uh, log incomes and then uh, 0.48 log incomes. So we see the same trend for uh, northern and southern region, okay? So uh, the fix the uh, final uh, objectives looks at the proper growth, okay? Not, not adjusted for uh, different things in inequality and adjusted for inequality, okay? So we see that there is some loss in growth, okay, following a, some increase in inequality, which is similar to the trend I presented, that there is some increase in inequality from 0.38 to 0.39, okay? So we see that there is some loss in growth. And then what we now did there is to uh, try to remove inequality in education and health to see whether there will be a, an improvement in uh, well-being. And when we did that, we saw that when we uh, gave when we gave uh, the same level of education to every household uh, household, we see that uh, that uh, there is a positive change in in growth up to zero point point uh, zero two. Okay, so and then we did this for education, and we see we also uh, see a positive change that uh, removing inequality in education and health uh, leads to improvements in household well-being. Okay, so. In, in, in conclusion, when we, of course, we leverage on the micro panel survey data that examined this impact on welfare outcomes in line with the title or the AERC title here. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, in Nigeria, most of these studies that have done similar work are macro studies, okay, that, you know, does not look at uh, individual uh, the micro differences in well-being, okay? Of course, macro data cannot be able to look at uh, these uh, micro differences in poverty and inequality in the country, okay? And so, of course, they wouldn't be able, it wouldn't be able to account for endogeneity issues in, in education. And so, uh, and of course, it did not make use of a panel household data set. So we reverged on this to, uh, provide uh, a detailed analysis of the impact of this human endowment on a poverty inequality and inclusive growth in Nigeria. And we saw that sh for sure that schooling significantly increases South Sudan economic well-being and sickness reporting does the opposite. Then, uh, okay, so in the, ne the next slide is uh, con uh, conclusion for other uh, key variables. So the key uh, policy recommendation is that, you know, there is a, a need for a, a targeted social uh, protection uh, programs and policies, okay? So to be able to improve the well-being of the poor households. For instance, in education, you know, government can look into scholarships and then in health, government can look into health insurance, uh, you know, to be able to improve, to improve the access of the poor uh, to these services and you know also uh, also increase in employment opportunities which the, is barely done by African government but you know yes it's still alternative of you know maybe trying to provide cheap uh, energy sources for uh, individuals to establish their own businesses that can be uh, so that can be sustained in the long run and then again some basic amenities and infrastructures like uh, that that will be able to boost uh, these uh, individual businesses to improve the well-being of the uh, poor households in rural and northern regions, so that we can have uh, equality across these zones uh, uh, in the country. Thank you very much. Can we put our hands together for the presenter? quite technical and very elaborate. Well done. So at this point, we are going into the panel section. Permit me to bring up stage. We have um, two of our panelists virtual, while we have two of them on site. So in no particular order, I will just read their profile and invite them to join me off stage. Is it a graduated MBBS from the College of Medicine, University of Lagos in April 1980, and proceeded to the State Hospital, Ijae, 
an Addis Abba Abiy Akuta for his mandatory housemanship. His focus as a public health physician has been in health system development and epidemiology. He chose to complete the examination of the West African College of Physicians and was awarded the fellowship by examination in 1994. He has practical experience in the management of complex health systems and has served as the chief medical director of the Lagos University Teaching Hospital from October 11, 2006 till October 10, 2014. Over the years, he has conducted research in areas of health system development and epidemiology with over 120 publications. He has also supervised over 70 postgraduate theses to date. He is a member of several professional bodies and NGOs, including the Nigerian Medical Association, Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria, Royal Society of Health, of Public Health UK, American Public Health Association, New York Academy of Science, the International Society of Infectious Diseases, the National, the Nigeria Health Foundation, and the NCD Alliance Nigeria. Join me as we welcome Professor Aki Oshibogun. Also, we want to welcome our panelist online. She is a histopathologist who holds an MBBS from the College of Medicine, University of Lagos, as well as fellowship in pathology, anatomic pathology to be specific, and laboratory medicine of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria and West Africa College of physicians respectively, which makes her eligible to practice in Nigeria and the West African region. She is an alumna of, this, of Sage Business School, University of Oxford Executive Education. She is passionate about contributing to healthcare sector through dedicated delivery of excellent pathology service and leadership. As an avid researcher, she has publications in local and international journals and also reviews their articles for the foremost national postgraduate of Nigerian pathology journal and a lecturer in atomic, in anatomic pathology at the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. She is a WIMBY's mentor and one of the most, one of the first 50 founding members of GI Africa, the first C-suit women-only business club in Africa. She is a member of the female-only angel investors club in Africa called Rising Tide Africa, interested in promoting female entrepreneurs with seed investments. Join me as we welcome Dr. Olayemi Daudu. Can we project yeah. her? Can you say hello to everybody? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you. Okay. Join me to welcome upstage a professor of economics of the University of Lagos. Our research interests include development economics with special focus on themes relating to economics of human resources, economics of education, health and human capital, poverty, income distribution and human development, gender and development studies and development finance. Professor Dauda is a senior faculty member in the non-residential fellowship program at the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, NESG. She is widely published in learned local, international, and international journals. She's a reviewer and editorial board member 
of some notable journals such as African Development Review for African Development Bank and Economic Change and Restructuring by Emerald. She is a development economics with more than 20 years of experience in research, teaching, and consulting on issues of African development. Can we join our hands together for Professor Risika Dauda? And finally, the other virtual panelist, she is no other person than a development and gender expert with extensive experience implementing research and development projects on social determinants of health behavior, health systems, gender inequalities, as well as social and economic inclusion. She was most recently, she was most recently the research director, appointed as a research director at the Population Council, Nigeria, and in that role led design and implementation of monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning projects across Nigeria. She led the development of the National Gender-Based Violence Dashboard, an innovative platform for the collection of validated real-time GBV data in Nigeria for the EU Spotlight Initiative. She was also the team lead for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded evidence consortium for women group in Nigeria. Join me to welcome Dr. Osasui Dirisu. Thank you. And my name is Faith Iyoha. I will be your moderator for today. Please clap for me now. <laughs> Okay, we just listened to a very technical and with um, insightful findings uh, from the paper titled um, The Impact of um, Human Capital Endowment on Household Welfare. So I will ask a question that everyone should just speak to for now. So the first question I want to ask is, what are your thoughts about the findings of the research paper and which one resonates with your experience on the subject matter? So I would like um, um, Dr. Sasuyi to speak first before we come to this here. Dr. Sasuyi, please, if you can hear us. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's great to be here. I. I I think for me, um, a few things that stood out, um, we, I, I mean, given the current context um, in the country, we've had um, these gaps. We've been talking a lot, you know, having conversations over the past um, decade around the gaps, you know, in, in human capital, issues relating to inequalities. Um, unfortunately, um, now that we have, you know, set up that enabling policy environment to ensure, I mean, we the, the policy space, you know, in the last um, few years, we've seen a lot of improvements in terms of reflections around um, enabling policies for social investments, for social protection, and we've seen a lot of initiatives. I think my early thoughts would just be in thinking more about how to sustain um, whatever gains. We need to think about how um, these policies impact on regional disparities, in, impact on demand, impact on um, supply. Um, I'm happy to speak um, further when you know we get into the main panel. But the most important thing I just want to put out there right now is that there are huge gaps that are creating a lot more inequalities and disparities um, within the country. You know that really need to be urgently addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasui. And let's now go to Professor Akin. Please, what are your thoughts about the findings? Thank you very much for having me here today. I think that I wasn't surprised uh, that they found that economic growth did not reflect in the poverty alleviation, particularly when uh, you've not handled uh, the mechanisms for redistribution of wealth within your country, within our country. Uh, yeah, I, 
<laughs> Please excuse me for that. You know, so I, I wasn't surprised. And the other thing is we often tend to confuse growth with development. Uh, economic growth may not be synonymous with development, particularly if you focus or you realize that uh, development is about man. And you want to look at the level of education, you want to look about their health, you want to look about their standards of living. And most of those factors that are related to human development, we can actually handle them in this country because the resources are there and you can generate the wealth when you apply uh, human capital to the natural resources that are in plentiful conditions uh, that are bound in this country from Lagos to Maiduguri to uh, Shokoto, you see the land, you see valuable land line fallow, and you have a population of 200 million. So you are, we are not capitalizing on uh, human capital. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, quickly, we'll go back online. Um, Dr. Daude Aulayemi, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, please. What are your thoughts about the findings of the research paper and which one resonates with your experience? So um, thank you very much again for inviting me to the panel. I think most of the findings of the paper actually resonate with my experience. And um, what was delightful was to see, you know, most times we speak um, about these factors without carrying out um, research and having evidence-based backing in what we're discussing. So for me, it was good to see a technically done uh, research to back some of the assumptions that we've had in terms of the distribution north to south, the um, level of education in the north and it's in the south, the disparity in wealth from the urban to the rural areas. They definitely resonate with what you know we, are, we have always been aware of in terms of our uh, um, healthcare system in Nigeria and distribution of wealth. So um, basically that, that's what I have to say about now. Most of what was um, articulated in the document resonates very well with me because I, I totally Thank agree. Thank you very much. And let me call on Professor Dauda. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and First thing I want to say is this. I want to really thank the authors uh, for a good job, well done, and the fact that the objectives you know, were well defined and the results conform to our prior expectations. Yeah. It's expected. Uh, and one of the things is that growth uh, did not lead to any appreciable decrease in the in poverty incidence. Why? Just because that the benefits of growth fails to trickle down, you know, to the needy in the system, and the fact that growth never bring did not bring about employment opportunities, did not bring about you know, the fact that uh, there'll be emancipation, you know, and all that is very important for us to really take note of that. And we also must, I must also commend you uh, for taking up this in the sense that ensuring that the poor, the vulnerable groups, you know, have access to good quality education is of utmost importance to sustainable development. We must focus attention on this type of academic research and all that. But you see, when I was going through uh, the findings, I found something that is a little bit disturbing to me. And was it, apart from the fact that all the findings are you know, conform to uh, a priori expectation, the fact that before you can experience decrease in poverty, you need to be working in the former sector. You, something like that you know, was in your job that, you know, um, as many that are in the former sector have the, you know, there's tendency for them to decrease, to, to experience decrease in poverty. I was wondering what could be, you know, responsible, 
you know, for this? Why is it that those in the informal sector, you know, cannot improve their standard of living? So what should be done? And there, there must be policy uh, prescriptions from your study that must address this. Maybe, you know, in the former sector, well, the conducive enabling environment created there, you know, this is absent in the informal sector. We must do something because the poor, the vulnerable groups, they are mainly in the informal sector. And that is very worrisome. It's a thing we need to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. I, I still want to take you on that. So you just talked about um, the informal sector are, are the ones that are uh, dominantly poor. So how do you think the government can come into this space to bring them into the former sector so as to improve their welfare? You know, one of these, this is one of the things that they need to look at, you know, they need to point out in, in their work. One of the, these is to create an enabling environment for the, for the informal sector, you know, to try is very important. The informal sector needs an adequate supply of electricity. The, the, those that are working the barbing salon, the hairdressers, you know, and all of them, they need constant power supply. And in this part of the world, you don't have that. You know, many of them do not have access to good infrastructure, infrastructure deficit when it comes to road infrastructure. Somebody, you know, you, you, living around, let's say, in, in around Shomolu, these informal uh, sector people, they move to uh, Lagos Island to, to sell or some other inner places, you know, to trade. How many hours do they, do they uh, how do they get there? The state of roads, you know, and all that. We must take note of this. Now, what about the access to funds, to loans? How do they have access to loans? Because some of these people working in the informal sector, they do not have collateral to give to the banks. And banks must do something, you know, to create enabling environment, you know, a special structure for them so that they will have good access to loanable funds that they can reinvest in their businesses. You can go on and on, you know, to say so many things that they need in this sector. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we'll go online and um, um, we'll be calling on um, Dr. Daudu. Olayemi, please, can you talk to us about your experience with healthcare inequality in Nigeria? Thank you very much for the question, Faith. Um, like I said earlier, it's not um, the paper kind of confirmed a lot of assumptions that we had before, and it's not far off in the healthcare system as well. In terms of the distribution, you find that people that reside in the urban area have um, access to better healthcare than those that are in the rural area. If you look at it from the aspect of the kind of infrastructures that are available or the non-existent infrastructures that are available in the rural areas, that is one aspect. In terms of personnel, you find that most health, uh, healthcare workers are more skewed to work in the urban areas than in the rural areas, creating a deficit there you know, as well. And then in terms of funding, access to funds to, even when there's availability of healthcare, most of the people in the rural areas are part of our extremely poor uh, citizens in the country, living uh, with less than $1 a day as um, a source of uh, funding. So those are part of the things that you know have um, been a bit glaring when you look at it in terms of inequalities. Another thing is also our cultural beliefs as well. They've also provided um, bottlenecks for, let's say in the North, a female uh, or the wife of someone there accessing healthcare by someone who is not of the same sex. And if that is not available, then that person is deprived of uh, access to healthcare. So that these are some of the things in terms of inequalities that uh, come top of mind when I, I look at the healthcare system in, in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Um, the low government spending in healthcare has left many Nigerians with no option 
but to seek health need from out of pocket spending, usually associated with high impoverished infants. So I would like to ask um, Professor Akin, what measures should be adopted? What are the measures that you think we should adopt to reduce the spending, the out of pocket spending burden on the household? Thank you very much. Uh, of course, inequality is uh, inherent in any system where uh, people have to spend out of pocket. And of course, uh, those countries with the worst health outcomes are those countries where uh, the major means of financing health services is by out of pocket. And the reasons are straightforward. Uh, if you have to spend the money out of your pocket, then you think twice before even going for health care. And then they go when the conditions have been uh, complicated because they delay in going for health care because the money is going to come directly out of their pocket. And when they delay in going for health care, the outcome will also be terrible. And that is one of the reasons why we have uh, very poor health outcomes in the country. As much as 70% of total health expenditure in Nigeria is coming from private and out of pocket expenditure. And there are different ways by which we can address that. Uh, we, we can learn from the history of other countries. And we do know that uh, uh, governments can fund their services through different mechanisms. One can be from general revenue. Of course, you tax people and then you, which is the UK model, the national health service in the UK, or you can uh, legislate and mandate health insurance. And I tell you for free that if you can get 50 million Nigerians to pay 1,000 Naira a month for health insurance, a social health insurance scheme, that already gives you 50 billion Naira every month. Uh, you remember our population is uh, 200 million. I didn't say 200 million Nigerians, just 50 million Nigerians to pay 1,000 Naira a month, just 1,000 Naira. And that is far less than what people spend on uh, phone calls. So 50 billion Naira a month times 12 months, that's 600 billion Naira, possibly larger than, uh, no, no, sorry. Yes, 50 billion, no, it's 50 billion, 1,000 times 50 million, that's 50 billion times 12. I think that's about 600 billion, possibly larger than what is the national budget on earth now. So if you can get that, then you can uh, guarantee certain services to Nigerians, health services to Nigerians. Of course, the second leg of it is to spend more and uh, spend less and achieve more. That is, I'm talking about efficiency now, the efficient use of resources, and then adopting the subsidiary principle, you know, rather than centralizing. Um, I was happy reading uh, something from the speaker of the the new speaker of the house of rep that is going to be looking at restructuring you know giving more power to local authorities to be able to do certain things so if you accumulate those funds i will not suggest that you accumulate them into a central pool so they be locally managed so that the people are managing their own funds and taking care of their own health and then of course the government will still uh, be interested in some public goods goods that have to be financed in the interest of the public. Uh, immunization, for instance, is one of them and similar things that will protect the general public. I, I think that's the way to go. And I hope that uh, we will go that way. Okay, let me ask another question just to follow up on that. How do we incentivize the household to pay this 1,000? Well, uh, of course, it's unfortunate that uh, we bought the idea of uh, structural adjustment programs uh, when it was encouraged that uh, developing countries should reduce expenditure on social sectors. Uh, governments must educate their citizens. That is the first thing. So there's no way you will not educate your citizen. The countries where social adjustment programs were first advanced already had social structures on ground. But you don't even have social structures on ground, and then you are not developing those structures. So the first thing is you must educate your citizens. At least up to a certain level, once you're able to educate them, they'll be more productive, they'll be healthier, because they'll know how to protect their own health and to prevent 
disease. And then, of course, you must also invest in health, you know, so that those who fall through the net can have some safety nets. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. So let's go back online. Um, Dr. Sasui, are you still with us, please? Dr. Sasui, are you with us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. So the disparity in health and education outcome in Nigeria has been growing. And um, we know that there are disparities across region and even gender. So how do we bridge this regional disparity in Nigeria? And how do we bridge it in terms of the, the gender? Okay, thank you very much. Um, when we, um, and thanks again to AERC and NASG. Um, when we think about disparities, um, we have to look at, let's look at it, for example, from the supply side and the demand side. So looking at the demand side, um, the first thing we, we ask ourselves is, what is the social culture, cultural context in which um, these disparities are occurring? So for example, we look at um, disparities in access to education. Let's take the girl child, for example. So for example, we have um, issues relating to social norms, just social norms around how a girl should be socialized and what she should do and by the time she's 10, you know, social norms that drive um, early child marriage, you know, that drive, um, you know, girls settling down, you know, in homes or using girls as transactional opportunities for families to settle as uh, scores, you know, just objectification of a girl, you know, is what makes her, for example, get married off early. This obviously would immediately create clear disparities in health because, you know, all the risks associated with um, teenage pregnancy, the risks associated with, for example, um, um, you know, VVFs, vesicle vaginal fistulas, and all the different health complications that just come from getting married early, the psychosocial burden of a young girl finding herself in, in marriage. Then you think about the, the, health, the educational disparities. She, she has to go out of school, you know, that already cycles her out of the school system. Then you think around issues relating to infrastructure. Whenever we think about regional disparities, we have to remember that we have huge infrastructural deficits. So where are the schools? What is the access, uh, access point? So how long does it take, for example, a child to travel to school? So for girls, parents, you know, for fear of gender-based violence and all that, can keep their children out of schools just on the basis of the fact that, you know, you have access um, as a problem. Then you think about production of teachers. You go into the schools, for example, in, in some parts of, of Northern Nigeria, you have very, very few female teachers. Why is that important? Those are the role models. Those are the people that the girls will look up to, to say, okay, I have three or four teachers in my community. I'm, a, I'm also going to go to school, you know? So we have, you know, then ask the, the, the issues relating to quality of the education that these children are going to access. I remember a study we did last year, and we found that one of the big issues relating to you know, disparities are just poor aspiration. And so if I go to school, what's going to happen next? You know, I don't see people who go to school in my community coming out better than those who don't um, 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 go to school. So these are some of the things. And then the big, the big elephant in the room, which we've been talking about, looking at the fact that poverty. So um, when you think about access, for example, to, to school, there, there's so many other things that need to come in. Even if you say schooling is free, a child, a parents still have to look for money for transport, for feeding. I know we'll talk about school feeding program in a bit, you know, so look for all the associated costs. So these are all the things that are creating um, regional disparities. And if we're going to look at the supply side, even when you have a policy enabling environment, you know, you have the gender policy in education, we have policies that actually now encourage, you know, enrollment, increase in enrollment, initiatives increase in attendance. We have a problem, for example, with sustainable development in Nigeria. So we, we create policies for today. Are these policies backed by funding? Are the, is the funding mechanism for these policies to enable enrollment of girls in school? Is it sustainable? Are we looking at the entire spectrum? So you can start by just looking at, okay, there's a policy that enables enrollment. What are the other associated factors? you know, that would help to ensure that 
we can enroll girls and keep them in school. And when you think about health disparities, it's the same thing. I visited um, two states in 2019 on a verbal and social autopsy project, looking at you know um, issues relating to infant and under five mortality um, in the previous year when you know we're doing the NDHS. And you will find out we went to entire communities that had no health center, entire communities that had no school. You know, entire communities access healthcare services, you have to walk. And we don't have even a public transportation system. So you have to walk, you know, for two, three hours to get access to care or two, three hours to get access to the closest school. And one of the community leaders said to us that in this community, once you need a doctor or a nurse to attend to you, consider it a death sentence. Because where do you start from, you know, in terms of getting the transportation, getting all the different, you know, arranging yourself, arranging the funds to pay for healthcare services. And then, you know, so you're looking at the different levels of delays from accessing care. And these are all the, dif the different reasons why we have regional disparities. And then when you look at gender, for everything I've talked about, the outcomes are always worse for women. Women are bound by a lot of social cultural norms that may even limit them from leaving their house to go into the hospital without, for example, taking permission uh, from their husbands. So going forward, a lot of sensitization is, in, is needed a lot of male involvement, you know, having conversations about men, making a business case for empowering the girl child beyond just conversations around, oh, she needs to go to school, she needs to earn a living. Just understanding that the big picture around sustainable development is hinged on ensuring that we advance gender equality in a way that ensures that the country, everyone is growing together, no one is left behind. So male involvement, community involvement, ensuring that the right investments are made, ensuring that the investments that are made consider the gender gap in the first place. And on the basis of that gap, create opportunities to ensure that there's balanced enrollment of girls in school, that the health system is responsive to the needs of girls, communities are carried along and the government is always reflecting on how to ensure that whatever gains that we make in 2023, for example, are working towards sustainable development and not just something that ends, you know, we, we finished 2023 and we're like, oh, we made provision for it last year. There's no provision um, for it this year. So there are a lot of opportunities to advance, you know, gender equality and reduce these regional disparities, but we need an integrated sustainable approach to achieving this. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasui. Let me ask you another question from what you just said. You said there are opportunities, that opportunities are bound, right? So can you please just hinge on some of the opportunities that will help close this regional disparity, especially when it comes to gender? So the biggest opportunity really um, is the elephant in the room and that's leadership. So first of all, we need to, um, you know, a lot of advocacy work needs to be done. I know um, last week I was in a meeting and some people said, oh, we, we, we're tired of talking about um, gender equality. No, we can't get tired of talking about gender equality. We can't. So I think the first thing is advancing, you know, very focused advocacy for leadership to understand that Nigeria as a country will not make much progress if we are leaving a gender behind, a region behind, development has to be collective. So one is leadership. So advocacy to leadership, making that business case to see that women actually have a lot to contribute to um, development proven by statistics, okay? And on that basis, see investing in ad addressing regional disparities in gender as a business opportunity for growth within the country. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasu. Um, let me come, come back here. Professor Riskat, please. Um, according to the World Bank, about one third of poor and vulnerable working age in Nigeria, they cannot read and write. They can speak, but when you print papers for them, even in their own dialect, they can't read it. So the question is, how can we bridge, how how could equity rather, how could equity in access to quality education be achieved so that those at the bottom of the pyramid, income pyramid are not left out? Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, I want to start um, from a viewpoint that many of us don't like talking about. It's about money. If you think education is expensive, try estimating the cost of ignorance. And you find it in violence, you know, everywhere war, people fighting unnecessarily, you know, among themselves, tribal wars and all that. It's just because of the fact that, you know, ignorant as the one way or the other push them to that. So that is something. And uh, having said that, um, I share the view that in a situation that we find ourselves in a country like Nigeria, where there is high incidence of poverty, government has a big role to play. Many do not share this view, but I see believe in that, in the sense that public spending in education is very, very important. And why is it important? You know, many people are living in, in, in poverty and they do not have the wherewithal to send their children to school. And that is why they should come in. And when this money is available, there is a need to invest in key inputs. What are the key inputs? We talk about physical infrastructure, the schools. We must provide schools to them in the rural areas. You don't have to trek thousands of kilometers, you know, hundreds of kilometers before you get to schools. So infrastructural facilities in, in terms of schools, you know, must be made available in the rural areas because that's where we have the core for, that's where we have the vulnerable uh, groups. They must not be uh, left behind. That idea of leaving no one behind, we must buy into it as a nation and pursue it uh, vigorously. Now, we have to talk about the issue of manpower. That's another input. We must invest in our teachers. We must make sure that they know what they are doing. Because if a student, a puppy goes to class once and the class is not interesting, what will happen? The student will not go, the puppy or the student will not go back, will not want to go back, especially those in the area, the rural areas where you are still encouraging them to come to schools. You know, it's very important, you know, for us to really uh, take note of that. Also, we need to invest in, you know, infrastructure like the soft skills, make sure that IT, you know, people have access to IT and all that. Even in the rural areas, they need to invest in, 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 in technology is not only meant for, for those in the urban areas to have access. We are all aware of what happened during the COVID-19, the era of, you know, of, of online learning and all that, who says those in the rural areas will not have us, cannot have access to online uh, learning. We must devise a way of coming up with flexible learning that can bring them into whatever you know uh, uh, we are doing so that they can learn. Now, one thing that we also have to take note of is the fact that we must motivate them. These are the people that don't believe, many of them don't believe in you know, education. And we must motivate these people to come, you know, uh, to school in order to be part of, to be able to have access to good, you know, quality education. We're talking about access, you know, to quality education. And a panelist had made mention of the fact that there is a need to invest in female education. That is something that we must have a deliberate action. We must put policies in place that we encourage female education. You know, many of us, many of them in the rural areas, they have, they, they, they have the opinion, they have the opinion that when you invest in girls, when you invest in women, you are just throwing away your money. They, it's throw away, throw away, you know, 
and all that. So we must disabuse their minds through public, uh, you know, enlightenment programs so that we bring them, you know, into schools. We, th this aspect of school feeding program, we, we've been doing it in Nigeria and there is the need to monitor, you know, evaluate, you know, know whether this thing is working, what are the things that we need to put in place so that it will work and encourage, you know, puppies, students, you know, to come to school. That is one of the ways. These are the ways, some of the ways, you know, through which we can enhance access to quality education. In okay, thank you very much, Prof. I will just um, ask you a follow-up question on that. So you made mention of um, um, school feeding program as one of the ways that government have used to incentivize them um, out of school children. What other projects or what other policies can government enact to incentivize and um, reduce the number of out of school children? Okay, you know, uh, one thing that we must also understand is that we must embark on a kind of bottom, you know, up approach. We need to get to them. Ask them questions. The people, the household, the, the rural household. What is it? Why is it that they are not putting their children in schools? Move with them. There is, you know, a kind of there should be a kind of stakeholders' participation. Let them be part of the policies that government will put in place to encourage them, you know, to, to, to come to school. Another thing we are talking about the how we can give incentives you know, to them to encourage them. We must not fail to understand that they have parents. And most of these, their parents are very poor. They do not have resources even to, to buy shoes, to buy things for them. If the government can afford, can say tuition is free, they will not go there naked. They will not go there barefooted. So there is a need also to put something in place to empower women, especially empower women i'm so sorry for this that i'm not <laughs> you know yes empower women because when you empower them they know where to put the money into they know how to make use of these resources know how to invest in these uh, children so it is a very good thing you know that must be done we must invest in, in women to get them to do the job. Thank you very much, Prof. A round of applause, please. Let's go back online. Let's call on Dr. Dawudu Olayemi. Um, lots of talk and um, regarding health. A lot of talk regarding health. So I just wanted to find out, Dr. Olayemi, how do we revamp the health system in Nigeria? Thank you very much for your question, Faye. Hmm. There are a lot of uh, priorities and a lot of things to be done to re revamp uh, healthcare in Nigeria. And um, like I usually always talk about data, an Thank example you. of the paper that has been presented today is that using evidence-based facts to drive uh, policies in terms of also prioritizing what the real status you have is. And I'm usually passionate about us using our own indigenous data, which is what uh, this paper has done. Not data from donors or sponsors that are looking at just disease specific um, areas, but looking at strengthening the general healthcare system. So part of what I think we need to do is to um, work with the government, the government being the uh, driver of this process in getting our own raw indigenous data of our health uh, status, our infrastructure, the indices in, in terms of prioritizing what the issues are and then being able to tackle them by putting them in order of a priority, budgeting for them and driving policies around them uh, some of the things we need to look at. In, in terms of um, infrastructure, we need to do um, an assessment and an audit of the infrastructure we have in terms of infrastructure across the uh, nation. And then looking at putting in place the infrastructures that are needed for us to be able to deliver quality healthcare 
across the social strata. So whether from the rural to the urban areas. Another way of uh, revamping the healthcare space is in terms of driving a policy to um, respect and honor the referral system in the country. What we have currently now is there's a primary, secondary and tertiary uh, level of in the healthcare system. But you find that of course, because the infrastructure and the personnel are not available at the primary healthcare level, you have abuse of the proper um, referral system with conditions that you're supposed to handle at the primary healthcare level, like screening and all those things, you find them burdening the secondary and the tertiary healthcare facilities and system. So we need to work on uh, also incentivizing our personnel so that like I mentioned earlier, you would have people, healthcare workers in the rural areas. This is all backed up by all having provided the infrastructure as well and incentivizing personnel to also remain at that level to render services. We, we have a problem with almost all the cadres of um, healthcare personnel in Nigeria currently with our brain drain. And that is something that we really need to look at in staving off uh, uh, poor healthcare delivery. I also hear a prof um, on site was talking about use of um, technology. And I love the part where she said, who's to say because people are, are in the rural area, they can't use um, technology in driving, whether it is education or healthcare. We need to look at that as well. And for me, when I look at that, it's, it should be with an inter-collaborative approach in different sectors. So the information and technology or the technology sector, financial sector in terms of uh, being able to access the um, services that will be provided and then working very closely with the state health insurance schemes and the national health insurance as well in terms of provision um, of uh, funds for people to access this care is very important. I do know that the government has put in place, I must say, some remarkable policies in recent times. The impact, I mean, most of them have not really fully been implemented, so we cannot talk about the impact currently. You have the basic healthcare provision fund, you have the um, uh, National or Nigerian Cancer Healthcare Fund. These are all part of the ways to, that the government has put policies in place to try to help in terms of access or finance for health. Apart from that, you have um, um, taxes that have been also uh, put in place via policy, sugar tax, tobacco tax. We still can do a lot more in terms of harnessing funds that we can drive, especially towards the indigent uh, and poor in the country to help them to access healthcare. Those are some of the things that uh, come to my mind right now in terms of working together to get more out of the healthcare system. Thank you very much. Prof, do you have anything to say to that just to add to what she has said? To advance our health systems, we will, of course, need to address the issues of uh, leadership and governance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we need to be a local in uh, addressing our health problems. In other words, uh, we need to have, uh, for instance, health centers need to have geographic and population responsibilities defined for them. That way you capture every citizen in your country and then, of course, if you uh, follow that up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, local management of health facilities, then, of course, there will be more confidence in the system because they are the, one, the ones managing their own health facilities. And therefore, because presently, we have underutilization of health facilities, particularly primary health centers, despite the huge uh, disease burden. So it's paradoxical. But because the management of those facilities are, is detached from the users, uh, there, there is, there's little confidence. So we need to go back and address the question of health leadership and governance at all levels. And then we need to address the issues of financing. 
And as I mentioned earlier on, there are innovative ways by which you can get additional funds into their system and then ensure that citizens get access to quality health services. And once they have access to quality health services, the referral system will begin to work. The referral system, which Dr. Daudu mentioned, uh, has failed because of loss of confidence in the lower levels of uh, the health deliver healthcare delivery system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we've spent a lot of time in this session, so I will just go around and um, ask a closing question before we go to our Q&A briefly. So in closing, Professor Riskat, in closing, what are the first three steps that must be taken to revamp education and the uh, industry skills mismatch in education? Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind is that there is a need to um, encourage and continue to encourage partnership with the private sector. It's very important because the industrialist in the private sector, you know, uh, knows what uh, we need to move out of poverty, to eliminate poverty, address the issue of income, uh, inequality and all that. They know the skills. You know, the, 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 the private sector must work on the skills for the future of work or the world of work. When we talk about these skills, communication skills, today, as we have it in Nigeria, you, you, you go to the street, you ask, the, the, you ask questions from the youth. Not many of them can speak French, you know, uh, Russian language, you know, and all that. There is a need to know how to communicate so that some of these products that the private sector, you know, you know, uh, is selling or will bring on board, they will know how to you know, engage with others on the African continent or outside so that this, this will be done. Another thing that I want to uh, say, what about the cognitive and intellectual skills? The private sector has a lot you know, to, to do in this case, because when we train them, these students, they go out there. So they, what, they interact with them. And there is a need to give the, 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 the university you know, system feedback that we encourage reforms in the, in the academic curricula. Is very important. And when you look around today, most of our courses that we have in the university, there is no, they say, they, 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 most, most of these students don't have experience until they graduate and they will start looking for job. There should be internship opportunities attached to all the courses. Even if they are, you are studying Yoruba language, you can be sent to Ileife to, 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 to dwell there for a week or two, learn about the culture, learn about all this. So every course must have must 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 be built in such a way that there'll be internship you know opportunities attached to to this it's very important for us to 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 do that then when we're talking about you know the need to revamp the economy we must look at something we must build a very strong early learning foundation because if we don't do that it will bounce back. And that is why we are having all these skills mismatch. When at the foundation, we are not giving them, you know, the best. They, they do not have, you know, creative, you know, uh, solving skills imputed into their lives at that point in time when they are in the primary schools and all that. So there are so many things that we can say here, but these are my three, you know, uh, Point. Thank you very much, Prof. Let me go to Dr. Sasui. Your final word, one quick wins to improve um, human capital development of the female gender so they can contribute to improve the, their welfare. Dr. Sasui, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, thinking around um, human capital de um, development, you know, I mean, focus on the female gender, but also speaking br broadly about um, development. I mean, just quickly, we've talked about investment in education, 
Um, if we know that the girl child is not prioritized for education and she's going to get to school, um, then we need to remove all the barriers. So in, in terms of um, user fees, uniform, sometimes you say, oh, school fees, there's no school fees, like you know we've seen in, in the past few weeks. But when you look at all the user fees, they add up to 20, 30, 40, 50,000. So that, that's one. And the other thing is really also investment, because we're looking at low income, um, rural, um, families. So we have to look at infrastructural investments. A lot of times we we overlook that because we think that there are bigger things that can be quick wins. But when you think about the fact that a lot of people in rural areas are subsistent farmers, you know, um, how do we make it better for them? Whatever improvements that we, we do for the parents, we eventually impact on the children. So can, how can we Im improve extension services for rural farmers? How can we ensure that there's value addition to the work that they do, improve access to roads, access to markets. As we enhance the opportunities for trade, we generally would improve um, well-being within families and then consequently improve, you know, what that means, you know, for the families at the end of the day. So we need to look at more focused investments around building skills, creating opportunities, having um dialogues and creating opportunities to really have conversations at the level of communities, break down the barriers that currently exist as a result of social norms. But in doing that, now provide the opportunities. Because if you deal with the social cultural environment, but we still have deficits in infrastructure, we still have deficits in investments. And I just want to mention here that as much as we think around social protection, we have to begin to think long term. You know, during COVID, we said, oh, um, yeah, this, these inequalities have come because of COVID. Post-COVID, we have the removal of the fourth subsidy that has also begun to see deepening inequalities in, in, in our society. People are shut off from the farm. People are producing. They can't move their farm. Um, um, they can't move their goods to the market because of the fuel costs. And so we have to think about what sort of long-term social investments in encouraging small businesses, in, in encouraging um, agricultural development, in encouraging, now we're going to even short of the teachers we are trying to send to rural areas to improve educational outcomes for girls. Now we're also going to be shutting out the health workers that we're hoping to send to rural areas to also improve um, health outcomes for women and children. So we need to think about long-term investments, social investments that will lead to more sustainable changes in the sort of improvements we want to see in gender equality. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasu. A round of applause, please. Professor Hakim, one last word, please. Well, uh, I think my point for takeaway will be that there cannot be any development without health. And investing in health is a key strategy for poverty alleviation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's go back to Professor Dr. Olayemi, please. One last word. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> mine will be around um, driving that we need to revitalize, revamp, and properly fund our primary healthcare centers. That is the bedrock when we look at universal healthcare coverage, because that's where we have the largest population of our people and the largest population of poor people. We need to revamp it, whether it's through PPPs, proper funding, incentivization of personnel that will give out the services at that level and the use of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. A round of applause for Dr. Olayemi. So we can now take questions and answer. Okay, I have answered. But before we go, so the questions will be for both the panelists and the presenter. So just get ready. But let me read from online first. So number one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So let me read from online from Dr. Bosede Olokmade. The study considered education years of household health, which had a significant effect on poverty level or welfare level, was the focus on formal education only 
or was vocational education captured in the study? Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, actually, the uh, variable that were used uh, to uh, measure education, which was the use in the regression, captures every level of education, both vocational, uh, because uh, in the data, you see uh, various levels, okay? We're starting from uh, households with no education, with primary education, with secondary education, with university education, all levels. So uh, we now counted numbers of, uh, of education, okay? So based on based on these uh, uh, categories, so that take for instance, if a, a household had reached secondary education, we give up to like maybe five years of completed days of schooling. So this particular variable captures or uh, all levels uh, of education to form that particular uh, uh, the key uh, correlates for this. Okay, thank you very much. So the variables that you used captured both formal and vocational education. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So from Dr. Olakpade, the issue of inclusive growth is only one way all contributes to economic growth. The issue of inclusive growth in one way, all contributes to economic growth. This is not clear. So I will leave it out and come back here. Let me take questions. So number one, please. Good morning. My name is Jacob Ipoga. I work with Continental Economy Magazine. Uh, first, I want to say, Prof, thank you very much, ma. I think you are the brain behind what I do today. I was your student, most have forgotten. Yes, we want to, I want to talk on a poverty reduction. I have a friend who just traveled to Canada. He read a, a Bible study in Nigeria, let me see, religious study. In Canada, he's now a farmer farming Ugu, to be precise, and it's making money. Then, during our discussion, I said, guy, if you have been in Nigeria and be farming yam along, you would have made more money. But he said, he went to school because he wanted to go to school. And there was a documentary I listened to here where a similar thing was said. Prof, how possible, or is it not possible for for us to revisit the school curriculum, that some courses that are, to me, they are not necessary, sorry to say. Because of that, BK would have gone to a school of theology and read and be a pastor. Can't we drop those courses and focus on courses that can improve our economy, precisely agriculture? Now, the federal government just approved a loan, a student loan. Um, uh, from when our people say. <laughs> Now, uh, Nigeria Economic Summit like Group, I believe they are a very strong voice. Can we, be visit, can we uh, uh, approach the federal government that they should visit that loan and channel it to uh, agricultural students? That when you, are, when you are serving or once you finish your service, for the period you will stay at home, I do, go and take a loan and go into farming and increase our, our food production. Then, Professor, you made the very point, which I'm going to visit you later. Uh, 1,000 per month, 50 million people, how much? 50 billion naira. That's a very good one. The problem we have now is the informal sector are not short. And it's a problem there. And many of them, they feel uh, excluded. Now, how do we go about that? And also, Coming back to your NSDG, how can you help us to promote what uh, Prof said now, that this formation can go wider and ensure that we are all insured and our economy can improve? Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to uh, thank you that you are representing us well outside there. Uh, there is a need for us to reproduce ourselves in others. So thank you very much for that. Uh, keep it up. Now, the question on the kind of courses that should be dropped, uh, please, we need to be very careful when we're talking about this. 
recently the National Universities Commission, you know, brought up a kind of project, CC Mass, that is looking into this. I don't want to go, you know, into you know, uh, uh, these uh, trying to bring about a kind of reform so that what students are studying in our universities will be what the society needs. And I want to say this, you, you said something about those studying Bible or religious something. Uh, I, I beg to differ in the sense that this course is needed, is needed in our societies, why? Because if you look at what is happening all around us, good governance is one of the strategies for human capital development. And when we talk about good governance, that means there must be transparency, there must be accountability, you know, and all that. You must encourage people to participate, you know, and you know, those leading us must take responsibility for their actions and all that. But look at what is happening in our midst today. The country, this country has not been blessed with good leadership. And obviously many of them maybe fail to take courses in, 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 in Bible studies or in Islamic studies. That is the thing, that's the thing. There is these courses, you know, as, as funny as they sound or so, we need them to reform the social systems. It's very important. The social system, the values, our core values. More the students come to school, they will teach them in those core, in those Bible studies, in those this thing, Islamic studies to be diligent in school not to cut corners, not to cheat in schools and all that. And when you go to most of these East Asia, you know, some of these countries in East Asia, they focus attention on some of these ideologies, Buddhism, you know, and all that. And that, you know, you know influenced their students, influenced their people. So we should not downgrade whatever, uh, any cause. You know, if the languages that you speak, have a long way in shaping the way we think. It's very important. If I ask the questions from some of you, your children, do, can they speak your native language? Many of us, we fail in that regard. And when you start learning with your native language, it has a way of fostering or helping you to be creative. It's very important. They do this in most of these nations. So please, that is that. Now, the issue of uh, rechanneling of funds to to, to agriculture, um, please, we need to be uh, cautious in this regard yeah, as well. There is the need to look for money wherever we want to look for it. When it comes to funding of human capital, what is the role of the government? Government must be up and doing in this regard. What is the role of the private sector? This sector must be up and doing in this regard. What's the role of the NGOs? We have Bill Gates, you know, Melinda Foundation, investing heavily in the healthcare sector, encourage others to do so. Dangote and all the people that are, have money in the system, they should not only focus attention on their families, they should go to the, the rural areas, invest in people and make cause to understand that yes, with money, you know, something can be done. So it's very important for us to, to, to do that. What about the communities? We have to talk to ourselves and all that in terms of, you know, make sure you give birth to the number of children that you can adequately <clears throat> cater for. So the, the channeling all the money to agricultural sector is not, is, should, should not uh, be the kind of thing that we should all be, we should, we should, just be focusing attention on now. There are ways that we can do other things with our money. Thank you very much, Prof. So, Prof, he also asked the question, right? You directed the question at him. So, it's more of a comment. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can we go to the second person, please? Quickly, we are pressed for time. Okay, uh, my name is Robert. I also work for Cotton Kony Magazine. Um, I see the, the um, health center our discussion and her sector like um, a roller coaster moving around the same circle. Why I say that is that the primary healthcare 
as I know, is supposed to be under the administration of local governments. And now, um, I'm from Edo State. I know what local governments suffer when it comes to access to funds. And many of them can't even pay their, their salaries or their staff. And they are the ones who are supposed to take care of this primary health care. I don't you think that the primary health care should be moved from that level. And let it be, and let, and let, and let it be on that direct um, administration of the, of the, or the federal government, just the way as we have UBE, so that we have this primary health sector coordinated properly. As far as I'm concerned, you are saying, okay, take care of local uh, primary health care. And you are not giving the, the, or the government, that's lower to our government, the funds to do that. Prof, how do we address that? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I think it's just a question of definition of roles. Uh, mm -hmm. Primary health care services should be under the local government, and local yes. governments do get monthly allocations from the federal government. So maybe we need to re-educate our local government chairmen so that they can properly take responsibility for their mandates. Because primary, primary health care is uh, by policy, by national policy, under the uh, local governments. But of course, we can move beyond that. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, we can encourage local communities to also take responsibility for their own health, you know, by involving them in the management of local facilities. Presently, we are dumping facilities on them. The facilities are not owned by them. So we need to get local communities to own facilities and be involved in the management of those facilities while go local governments put some money into the local facilities. Of course, we have the basic healthcare provision fund, 1% of the consolidated revenue, 45% of that 1% goes to the provision of primary health care services. So federal funds are also coming in. And those funds go directly to health facilities. But those health facilities must have local management. And if they don't have that local management, they will not get maximum benefits, even from the funds coming from the federal level. So we need to address the questions of leadership and governance at all levels. And as Prof mentioned, when you start addressing the questions of governance, you are addressing the issues of transparency, you are addressing the issues of uh, accountability, accountability, you are addressing the issues of local participation in the delivery of services, among other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Number three, please. Good day, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Wamma Ogidi. I am the of work about Africa. Uh, the topic is very, very sensitive. Coming to the education sector, not only education sector, all the sectors in Nigeria, to me, I don't think any sector is working. But since we are looking at uh, education sector, going to through the local government down to the down trodden, nothing is working. Even some states that say they have free education, I, as a journalist, I've gone through some rural areas and found out that the education is free of education we said they have is nothing to talk about. At the end of the semester, university semester term, you find out that you paid more than uh, what you should have paid as a school fees contributing this and that and that. Recently, I registered a junior work for about three people. I was shocked to know the price and what they use in registering them than from Imo State. Even here in Lagos, where we have free education, every week your child or your house uh, girl will be asking, we are contributing this or that. And, and another one is at the end of every term, the schools are now doing parties. What is it called for? <laughs> parties, every time. Then graduation from nursery, kindergarten to, I mean, that is, my point is, uh, my point is. I have a, a, an uncle who is a lecturer in Unilag. He, he, his thesis mainly things down to the village, but the children doesn't speak our language, even the English, the Yoruba that we are. 
in Lagos, like you uh, rightly stated, man. How he says it's something to go about. You would like to read it because he talk about the main things that happens in the rural areas. Well, you teach and you don't practice. Please communicate to those that would like to hear. Our education is 0. 0.000. <laughs> you mentioned about uh, Bill, Bill Gates Foundation. The best form of advertisement is word of mouth. They are on paper. I have covered them. They're on paper, right. but there is nothing they are offering for now. Quote me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you please pass it to him? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for this uh, meeting. My name is Ken Dadibu, the director director of Malai Journalist Network. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I also want to emphasize something. There is a major variable that we didn't study, uh, in this, which is the variable of corruption. And uh, <laughs> as, uh, if my comment, with my own uh, concern may be a comment or question, because that variable will, will <laughs> it's, it's funny, but it's, it's, it's a major thing that drives us back to where we are today. Because when we look at constituency projects, uh, budget paddling, budget inflation, and sometimes even when they release uh, budgets for this uh, constituency project, they don't get executed, but the funds, they disappear. So we need to really address it because no matter how much funding we say, oh, uh, we need to push into this, we need to push into that. We see that uh, the, the, the informal sector, and some, unfortunately sometimes, even the employed graduates, or we end up in that informal circle. And you, it just I, sometimes a tie to. And, so, and I, one other thing that I also want to emphasize is that even the informal sector is already being taxed, even over tax, especially like in Lagos, there is a lot of informal money that is not accountable for. Like even if you ask the road transport <clears throat> workers, what they are struggling with, apart from the subsidy that has been removed to now, the informal sector, the, the, the money they are collecting is a major. So I think we need to address this issue, in, especially in this uh, report, and even at the National Economic Summit, it needs to put that, that it should be part of a thematic area that we need to focus on. Because unfortunately, if we don't address this, we'll continue. Because when we, some of us go outside the country, and you look at, you begin to say, Nigeria, what are the resources that we have that we can build our capacity? We have oil, we have even them father. It was when bandits was happening that we know that they had good. This round of friend. It's, it's a major problem. Nigeria is so blessed that Sweden is not supposed to be counting the number of days that you'll be spending their country for me. But it, we, we know what the problem, we need to address it and it should be a major focus. What, are, what if Nigeria has these resources, oil and everything? If, the, the sad effect part of it is that the communities that have even these resources are the ones that are even forming, falling at the bottom line of poverty. We need to really address this and if we don't address it, we'll keep coming to bring up research that will not even solve our problem. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please pass it over to him. Quickly, in one minute. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Naji Charles, uh, from the uh, National Coordinator of Climate Parliament. Um, I've listened to the conversations, and uh, one of the things I've uh, noted, the issue of um, growth, not necessarily development. And um, having noted that, I would like to ask to say something. In the education sector, um, uh, there's a recommendation by the UNESCO, by UNESCO that um, there should be, uh, we should devote about 15 to 20% of our uh, annual national budget to the development of the education sector. But in Nigeria, we have between four to 10% annually. That's been what's been happening progressively. And if we look at this, 
uh, four to ten percent. We know the implementation itself sometimes will have as poor as sixty percent implementation. So you say, okay, we're doing seven percent. Then you implement sixty percent of that seven percent. So you have this backlog of. Um, issues in that sector. Then we also look at the issue of mismanagement part of the funds that will be released at the end of the day. So that slows down the level. So at the end of the day, we have a backlog of issues in that sector as a result of these two factors. So we're saying, how do we mitigate these issues of uh, mismanagement to reduce that? And how do we also encourage government to see reason to invest more? Because there is a very strong interconnectivity between education and uh, development? That's the first question. Then I also ask, how do we encourage uh, um, that uh, the people in the private sector to do much more in encouraging the, that uh, in uh, financing or bringing, helping to uh, uh, do much more in the education sector? Then I also observe the fact that um, in looking at the people in the informal sector, you find that that uh, a number, of, a lot of people are in the informal sector, and uh, you see private businesses trying to bring them, trying to bring people to the informal sector. But you find out that the number of times what they do is uh, they encourage the criteria is just encouraging people who already have formal education, but they are transitioning. Maybe you already a graduate of many years, you don't have a job and you want to become a tailor and all of that, they're bringing you in. But those who are already in that sector, who are experiencing private uh, poverty, how do we bring them in? Then I also want to ask, should there be a legislation on um, encouraging the establishment of uh, primary health centers in either all communities or within uh, within some parts that uh, say within this kilometer and this kilometer, there should be a primary health center. Should there be a legislation in that regard? Because it's very necessary. Thank you very much. Prof, do you want to answer the last question before we move on? I, I don't think that uh, the establishment of primary health center is a problem because we already have them. Uh, I think uh, one study which I conducted some time ago shows that uh, almost 80% uh, of Nigerians don't need to walk for more than five kilometers before they get to a health center. The main problem is that the health centers are dysfunctional. You know, so they, they are dilapidated, they are not maintained, they are ignored, they are neglected, they are underfinanced, under-resourced. So those are the main problems. And we need to address those problems through some of the mechanisms we mentioned earlier on. If you have uh, a health insurance scheme, you know, so you have a pool of funds that are available and then you channel those funds to those health centers, they become more attractive, they become more approachable and they will be more uh, relevant to the needs of their community. And then of course, the management of those facilities have to involve the users of the facility. Community. Oh, yes, members of the community. Thank you very much, Prof. Please, can you ask your question or comment? Thank you very much. My name is Nanyo Mahi. I'm a medical laboratory scientist and a business development expert. So and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And um, I really hope we start walking the talk. We've, we've done a lot of, yeah, we've done a lot of talking and I think it's time to start walking the talk. So I just want to give some punchy ideas that we can look at things that I know that can really work. The issue of the informal sector, I've been in the trench and I tell you, the reason why these people don't want to be formalized is tax. So it's lack of education. They don't even know that as a new, the newcomer that in 18 months you are not doing anything about that because you're not making up to 25 million that is required for you to remit, right? So that's the issue, they don't know. Even the collateral, we have a national collateral registry that has, you can use your movable assets as collateral. So it's education. So we need to inform them to know that this is possible because just like we talk about data, when we don't have these people formalized, they can't get the funds that have, it, there are so many funds available that people don't know about. And it, it, it kills me. So many, because when, when I train and let them know, they're like, oh, this is existing and they don't know. So that's one of the issues. Then I want to give an example of where health insurance works. Oh, yeah, well, I stayed in Port Harcourt for 10 years. Oh, yeah, more health center. No, Prof may know about it. It was developed by Shaw. 
that health center looks better than some general hospitals. How did it work? Their health insurance was a little that they could pay. Something as, as of then, I think it was like 300 naira per month. Just like Prof was talking about 1,000 naira, which can be taken, there's, there have been so many proposals to that through our phones, right? So these are things that can work. Another one that can work on health insurance is through the faith-based organizations. Why? People trust them. So that can work. Then this issue of repairing our health system, I don't know how long we are going to talk about it. There are six building blocks of our health system. And I can tell you in Nigeria, all of them are crooked. And we must do something because without health and education, we can't grow. That's the simple truth. That's the, those are the key indices we need for development, not just addressing some diseases like our prof, um, our doctor online talked about, right? And then for uh, the health sector, we also need to look at diagnosis. Diagnosis is one key factor that is sending many people on medical tourism. The reason most people travel is either for blood work or for imaging. If we can look at this, and they are capital intensive. So government has to be intentional about it to make sure that it works. And we look at what we are, we are facing with forest. We need to prevent that flight, right? Thank and you. then, you want me to stop? <laughs> okay. okay. And just permit me. Then he talked about something, corruption. The money is going out. Who monitors and evaluates them? Prof also said something about that. So much, so much money is going out. The basic healthcare fund, the cancer fund that I was talking about, who is monitoring the usage? I can tell you that if these funds are managed, just like he said, leadership and governance, a lot of this, we'll find that we have money, but we are just misusing them. And then we have a time bomb we are sitting on that we don't know about. Our health workers, my colleagues are living in droves. A time will come you go to the hospital and the problem is no longer having a hospital, but who to attend to you? And we have to do something about that fast. The reason is this, no health worker wants to go to a rural center where there's no uh, infrastructure. There's no house, no internet, not even, even, even in internet light. You're not going after spending six, five, seven years, hello, in the higher institution, and you want to be subjected to that? River State did something wonderful some years back. They employed a lot of healthcare workers across all the stratas, gave them mobility, gave them uh, housing, and gave them allowances. Can other states look at that? I think that can work. Okay. Thank you very much. Finally, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you, Abwe. People have mentioned a lot of good points. Probably I will just try to emphasize some of it you have mentioned. Well, these are the things I actually have. But the first thing I'll start from, Prof mentioned something about expenditure. You see, my thing on that is that, you see, as long as we continue to develop, expenditure will continue to increase. But in Nigeria, out of pocket spending, we continue to increase as long as we don't have a well institutionalized health insurance system. If you go to the United States of America today and you don't buy it insurance, God help you if you sick. Yes. Also, uh, Wasiwa in there sometime in one of his, he said he had a particular man sometimes. And he, he, what they asked him to deposit in Nigeria hospital was outrageous. So he quickly purchased insurance in Canada. And he was treated of that ailment from the insurance he purchased in Canada without even paying any other thing. So I think we need to be think, I mean, to begin thinking about how we can institutionalize our health insurance. And you mentioned a point, sir, that uh, we should be contributing, probably collecting 1,000 per month. That may be difficult. And so rather, I will want to go with what Madam just said that. Let us, if you can charge this to phone call or data usage, you know, you even get more than a thousand naira from individual, even on a weekly basis, not on monthly basis. So, secondly, my professor Dada mentioned something about, I mean, informal sector having uh, major, Nigeria having major poor in the informal sector. Sir, Ma, I was corrected, I was, I mean, informed not to be saying that in 2011 or 2012. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was corrected on that in 2011 or 2012 when I was still doing my PhD. And the person that corrected me actually worked on the informal sector 
during the, for his PhD thesis. Now, in fact, the amount of wealth embedded in the informal sector, probably more than what we have in the informal sector. So what we need to do is to find a way of tracking the informal sector information. And if you look at the way they spend their money, you know, an educated individual cannot spend the way informal sector who spend their money. They can afford to, I mean, to make 500,000 today and finish every today because they are sure of getting another one tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yes, sir, to get another. So that's, that's my story. Finally, Mr. Henry, thank you for your presentation. But you see, some things I just want to call your attention to this as, you see, theoretically, we know health and education are social services. One of the implications or the first implication of that is that even if you are going to charge anything on it, it's not something that will give you, I mean, normal profit or whatever we have in our economic jam, but maybe just cover your cost of operation. Now, we have a government now that's ready to I mean, tax anything, increase price here and there, whatever. <laughs> whether you agree or not with it, whether that's another issue. But then, the panelists, some of the panelists, and those who are the panelists that talk, have found that the study, I mean, the uh, what they call the results of your studies, well, I mean, they agree with it, that a lot of studies have been done, also to confirm that. So what I was expecting that probably to get, and then somebody, some people have also mentioned the issue of corruption, etc. These are distortions that may not allow education ahead to give us the required uh, outcome that we want. So I was expecting that probably you take some of these distortions that are actually disturbing health and education to give us a desirable, desirable outcome. For example, if you say if a student attend probably a number, I mean, particular number of hours of school, it should be good grammatically or whatever. So if you are not having that, then what are those things responsible for that? Probably if we interact, some of these distortion, in terms of I mean, variable that are creating distortion with education and net, then we better know specifically what are the specific policy to do to correct all these problems. I mean, we're having this affair and we're also fed there pertaining to education and health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right about now, I want to thank every one of us for joining us. And I want to appreciate our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much, Professor Akin. Thank you very much, Professor Risikat. Thank you, Dr. Laiemi. And thank you, Dr. Dirisu. I really appreciate your presence. So um, just for those online, Abimbola Onyilola, thank you very much. We have seen your comments. Omolola. Oluwa Dare, thank you for your comments. And um, um, Dr. Olakpade, we have seen your comments. We'll take that into cognizance. At about now, we'll call on the Dr. Scholastica Odiyombo for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm here once again. Um, that was quite a, um, an excellent session, insightful. And um, I like how it came back to be um, the topic becoming wider and looking at, um, when you talk about poverty, they were looking at human capital development. And most of the time we look at education, health, and maybe training as vocational. But we are looking at the general economic issues behind uh, the, let me see, persisting issues of poverty, persisting issues of inequality, and what is affecting redistribution. Uh, some of the issues which came in was uh, maybe resource misallocation or misplaced priorities or a lack of prioritization of the most important issue. In Nigeria itself, uh, there was a sentiment that it's a very wealthy country, an oil producer, uh, has a lot of talent that generate a lot of wealth, has a larger dis dis diaspora who uh, bring in a lot of remittances, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, there are bigger conglomerates which are paying high level of taxes, operate taxes. So how can we leverage on both um, there was issues about comment uh, 
that uh, we can leverage on the private sector to bring development at the grassroots. Uh, there may be also issues of bringing development partners that are part of our development because we consume. We don't have, by the way, we have to bring them in, in that. Um, we are consuming their products, isn't it? So corporate social responsibility, whether at the civil organization, the, the international development partners, we have to welcome this development at any time and because of the global citizenship. So uh, how do we make sure that the political goodwill is enhanced and is pro poor? Uh, public private partnership, if it's necessary, uh, to, to promote this. However, we know that poverty and inequality are age old scenarios. They, they, will, they, they are perpetuating over time. What, what we, we do is how do we make sure is it doesn't make larger population more vulnerable than it has been, isn't it? Yeah, so even if it's income, incomes have been rising in Africa, isn't it? Uh, most countries in the recent 10 years, most countries were upgraded into middle, in lower middle income countries. And you can see that the poverty is still perpetuated. And uh, the, the, the interventions that are needed is a voice, uh, this in-country dissemination are used also to, uh, to give a voice to the policy actions. And I uh, hope the richer audience will pick up both online and here physically present will pick up on the titbits and on the tables, on the round policy round tables, on the policy decision, you can reinforce um, the um, what is spoken here, what the evidence which is pre presented here, evidence is very important, and what are the possible uh, policy action. Now, these days I don't talk about policy influence. I avoid a lot of policy influence, policy outreach, policy relevant action, meaning that if we come out from this, uh, th those who are here in the decision-making table, what are you going to do in your role uh, you can be the minister in the social welfare department or the one who is planning the economy or ministry of finance. What have you picked up from that? In order that when you go to the cabinet uh, secretary meeting, what are, are you going to say in allocating for uh, resources for Propoa? Making sure every child from zero to 25 Children are zero to 25, meaning that the education system give them time up to the first degree, isn't it? Or are technical skills. So zero to 25 years, what opportunity do they have? Uh, can they be able to sustain themselves after leaving school, especially basic school or even vocational training uh, or uh, at the level of degree? Can they be able to find quality jobs, decent jobs that does not make them vulnerable? Uh, are there job security? Is there food security? Is there healthcare? Even that is becoming a security. Healthcare security, meaning that if I go, there were sentiments about healthcare system. Do the healthcare system make people more poorer or making them more richer? Because if you go in because you are not healthy, you are deprived of your health and you cannot function, you cannot earn income. By the time you leave that health center, are you richer enough to go produce that income? Are you getting the sentiment? So those are the underlying issues which are coming in being spoken in many words we discussed. I thank the, uh, the, uh, the generally, I'm going to thank the panelists, the authors, Henry and Jane, the panelists. Um, I'll, I'll not be, <laughs> Faith is here, Faith. Maybe I love the list just so that I'm not biased. If I wanted to be safe, I say all protocol observed. <laughs> I like to be thankful to Faith, um, uh, uh, Professor King, Professor Dawood, uh, Professor Risikat, and uh, Dr. Osesai Osasui. I'm not using surname. I'm sorry about that also. So uh, for these rich insights you have given to the audience, a very lively and responsive audience, uh, very up to what is happening 
and very focused on a change, a better Africa and a better Nigeria. Thank you. The next step, sorry, just the next step uh, for this project is that uh, the policy briefs are out. Uh, they are on our website. If you go to www.africa.org, uh, um, arcafrica.org, you go to knowledge. Where there is knowledge, there's public repository. There are papers there, policy papers, policy brief papers. The next step is journal publication. And we'll have a regional policy forum for this project in March, 2024. Thank you very much. Oh, and the host, <laughs> Nigerian Economic Summit Group and all the team, and that is I'm observing protocol now, and all the team who have organized this event, thank you very much. On behalf of ARC and my executive director, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. So we can have our lunch, thank you. Pictures. Pictures. Okay, pictures, please. Can we quickly take pictures before Professor Akin leaves? Pictures, please. Panelists, please. Yes. 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 I'm <laughs> <laughs> 